And uh, to, to celebrate, we're bringing back Eric Immel from Boston, Massachusetts. Eric, welcome to Jesuit Lunch Hour. It's great to have you. Very grateful to be with you guys. Very grateful to have a redo. Speaking of technology, last week was just not my week, fellas. So we've modified, we've adjusted, we've learned. Here we are. It's uh, it's all about growth experiences, and it was not our week either. Know that, know that. So, but we're happy to be uh, just on a good on a good track. So, just to review, as a young boy, you grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I did. I am from God's own Green Bay, Wisconsin. That's right. And and grew up a Packers fan. Uh, went to what what high school did you go to? And 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 how did your education evolve from there? Sure. Great question. So there's one Catholic high school in Green Bay. It's called Notre Dame Academy. And it is historically a conglomeration of what used to be three Catholic high schools. The Norbertines were loosely involved in helping run the high school that I went to. And I think from there, I just recognized a deep desire to remain within Catholic education. So when I explored undergraduate institutions, I looked at predominantly Catholic colleges and after touring a few different schools, I landed at St. Louis University, which is where I met the Jesuits for the first time. After I graduated from SLU, I think I failed to capture maybe the one and most important thing about getting an undergraduate education, which is about learning how to make a good decision. I had no idea what I was doing when I graduated from St. Louis University. And in fact, had visions of working at a potbelly sandwich shop on State Street in Madison, Wisconsin. My father, God love him, has rarely inserted himself in my own choices about what my life should become. But it was at that point when I mentioned potbelly that he said, you know, you've just done this really great thing. Maybe you want to consider something different. And so I ended up moving to Madison, Wisconsin for the only two years of public education I've ever had. I got a master's degree in ed leadership and policy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then after that, I kind of bumbled along a little bit. I did a year of volunteering at Creighton Prep. I got a job at Creighton University and worked professionally there for three years before eventually surrendering to God's call and, uh, and landing with the Society of Jesus. So that's, uh, that's, that's terrific. And, you know, speaking of decisions, just as a little short commercial, my, my teammate, Father Michael Rossman here, wrote a terrific little pamphlet-sized guide on, on how to make good decisions. And I know in that, that stage of my life, in my 20s, it would have been pretty helpful uh, to me as well. But anybody who wants a copy of that, uh, contact Father Michael or, or, or me, and we're happy to send that to anybody. Wouldn't you say, Father Michael? Absolutely. Absolutely. I can put a link uh, underneath the video, too. <laughs> oh, terrific. Fantastic. Fantastic. What's, uh, what's, what's your mission right now, Eric? What are you doing there in Boston? Well, my room gets smaller and smaller every day. I am a full-time graduate student. I'm completing my theology studies on the track to ordination to the priesthood. And so right now, given the context of the world that we're all living in, I spend most of my day sitting at my desk. The stack of papers that I have printed to read this semester is about a foot high as well as a stack of very interesting, but sometimes quite boring books. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'm in the middle of getting my final exams taken care of. So I was just sharing with you guys before we went live that I'm working on some papers about salvation, about theology and culture. I'm in a church history course. So trying to make meaning of, you know, that time period between 0850 and 1650. So just 800 years of, of Catholic history that I'm trying to spell down into one nice tight little paper. I'm in a canon law course right now. I am in a course on social reform and American Catholicism. So my world is occupied by dozens or, or even many, many dozens of different ideas. And I'm just trying to hold it all together in this kind of last sprint and push to the end of my semester. So, Great. And Eric, uh, we had the privilege of living together uh, before you moved out to Boston. And so you know, your world wasn't necessarily consumed by 800 years of Christian history uh, for the years before you went to Boston. Can you say a little bit about what you were doing and um, what that institution is? Sure. I was very privileged to spend three years of my Jesuit life working and supporting Arupe College of Loyola University, Chicago. 
Arupe College opened now, I want to say five years ago. So it started just the year before I began working there full time. And the idea is that there's something valuable about Jesuit liberal arts education, but sadly that kind of education isn't accessible to everybody for a variety of different reasons. We recognized in the Chicagoland area that there were a number of young people, very capable, very driven, very willing, and tremendously talented who wanted to gain access to that kind of liberal arts education, but by no fault of their own, different parts of their identity, different opportunities presented to them diminished their opportunity to gain access to Jesuit liberal arts education. And so Arupe College was founded as a two-year associate's degree granting institution for students from divested communities in the city of Chicago. The hope is that they're able to graduate with little or no debt and an associate's degree from Arupe College, which then would set them up for success either in transferring to a four-year institution or entering the workforce as young adults. My role there was pretty dynamic. Uh, my title, if this is helpful, was the Associate Dean for Student Success. And so in a nutshell, I think my work was to help support students in every aspect of their life outside of the classroom. And so in that work, we had a very robust program of social support services. We had two full-time licensed clinical social workers on staff that provided case management and mental health support for students. We ran a full gamut of student organizations and programs. We did a lot of sort of crisis management. I helped work with our students on conduct related issues. We ran a full retreats and campus ministry program through the office that I was helping work with. So trying to create in the context of Arupe College, a robust in and out of class learning experience that would set these young people up for, for life after college. Great. It, it sounds like a very interesting part-time job. <laughs> yeah, right. by living with Eric, I can assure you it was very part time. Very part time. <laughs> um, Eric, what, you know, what did you enjoy the most about that assignment? And maybe this might be the same answer to to a different question, but what do you enjoy most about being a Jesuit? Great questions. You know, the experience at Arupe College was incredibly dynamic, and I think to identify one thing that I loved most about the work is sort of on the front end challenging, but I, I think it's, it's the students. I mean, I've been able to keep in touch with my professional colleagues at Arupe College in really good and healthy ways, but what I find more moving is the experience of being in my room now in Boston face deep in a pile of theological reading. And on my phone pops up the name of one of these students that I was able to form community with back in Chicago. They're just incredible young people who witnessed to me the power of resilience, the power of courage, the power of faith, the power of belief in oneself, of naming and claiming one's own worth, the power of what it means to be in some way, shape, or form, a broken person who seeks repair both in the world and through the world and the opportunities that the world provides. So what lingers for me more than anything about Arupe College is the gift of those young people, uh, their tremendous value, their tremendous capacity, their tremendous worth, and the way that they have utterly transformed my own life and my own worldview. So the students, long story endless, the students were the best part of my work at Arupe College. And, and I think my, my, my favorite part about, about being a Jesuit um, is that I think my Jesuit identity, and I hope that everybody has an opportunity to create for themselves some kind of identity like this, is that this word Jesuit um, really encompasses the entirety of my life. It's a way for me to focus myself on how and who I want to be in the world. Do I think that I could be a successful person and be a happy person in a different vocation? Yeah, I think that's true. I think that the world is much more dynamic. We're not so singular in the way that we exist. But for me, being a Jesuit is a way to frame my entire existence. It frames how I interact with other people. It frames the way in which I feel called to use my own gifts and talents in the service of others. It frames the way that I pray, it frames the way that I try to discipline myself. It frames 
the way that I consider what living is like every single day for me. And, and so I think just leaning now in these sort of eight years and change of Jesuit formation, um, it's really become the centerpiece of my identity, um, Jesuit. And then through that, the centerpiece of, of being a follower of Christ, of putting Jesus right at the heart of things and to seek companionship with and, and through Jesus. So. Great. Thanks, Derek. And I mean, you talked about how it's your whole identity and, and part of that too would be uh, living in community. Could you say a little bit about uh, your experience of perhaps your current community or perhaps your larger sense of Jesuit community and kind of what do you enjoy doing with brother Jesuits and, and what does all of that mean uh, to you? Community is, is the light and dark of my life these days. I think <laughs> that um, the way I think of community at this particular moment in history is that my time is a gift that I give to my brothers. My time is a gift that I give to my brothers. And so while it's easy for me to occupy a pretty individualized space to make choices, even small choices every day that benefit only me, um, every action in community life, and I think that's really exemplified right now, every action that I take not only affects me, but affects the men that I live with. It affects their well-being, their work, their own mission, their own study, uh, their own vision of how to be a companion of Jesus. And so it's in simple ways right now, wiping up the coffee that dribbles out of my cup when I pour it in the morning of being mindful to wash my hands before and after I've opened the refrigerator or taken out the bread to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's maintaining a spirit of prayerfulness in the way that we are called to continue to be men of prayer together in these unusual times. And I think also community for me is the source and summit in relationship with Jesus of the joy that I'm experiencing right now. I mean, thank God I have men who I live with that I can laugh with, that I can watch an episode of Seinfeld with, that I can rely on when I'm trying to write what I think is a very complicated paper about how salvation works. I've got guys in community that I can bounce these ideas off of that only grows our relationship with one another and our relationship with the Lord. Um, it's certainly challenging. I mean, Father Michael, Father Bill, you can attest that we don't choose the Jesuits that we live with and personalities are dynamic, cultures are complicated and beautiful. So leaning into the way that we live together is an opportunity to break open wide the heart of the church, the heart of what it means to be one human family. Uh, and I think we see that. And I experience that in my little house of seven people right now. So. Thank, thanks so much. As, as, we, uh, as, we, as we close, um, we, Father Michael and I obviously are working with, with guys in discernment, with um, young people who are, who are trying to find, you know, God's, God calling for them. Is there any advice that you, you'd give to a, a young person who is uh, thinking about a religious vocation? Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, I hope this is an edifying thing to say. When I walked through the doors of the novitiate, I was maybe 51% sure that I was supposed to be there. You know, I think that uh, in my previous Gosh, I mean, I was, quote, I, I sometimes say that I was flirting with disaster for a long time. You know, I, I first recognized some call to the priesthood between my junior and senior year of high school. But then I sort of let that vision, that idea sort of run away. Uh, I went to college and again, meeting the Jesuits, I just thought, gosh, I'm really moved by the way that this life and this vocation looks. But I never took the time to notice it because I think I was waiting for some moment of clarity I think in some vocation stories, people are able to really beautifully articulate that there was a moment, an aha, when they just knew. And I don't think that I've ever had that moment. I think for me, I spent years wrestling with the tension between certainty and courage, clarity and the bravery that I needed to simply accept that there was a subtle and persistent call in my life, and that was calling me forward. So I would just advise anyone in discernment toward any vocation to the Society mm -hmm. of Jesus, to a different religious order, to diocesan priesthood, to, to life in a women's religious order, um, 
that it's easy to hold on to this notion that it will become crystal clear at some point. Um, for me, that clarity still waffles and wanes. And what I remember is that I am happy in this life. And I'm happy because courage and commitment to this decision has guided me every single day. And so I think just being honest about that tension between clarity and courage uh, and letting the courage that God instills each of us with run wild, let that run wild and sort of fear of making a mistake. Try to let go of that as much as you can, uh, because mistakes will be made. Certainly uh, mistakes will be made. It will not always be easy. But I think for me, after eight and a half years, leaning into the courage and the hope and the love that God offers has been far more important than seeking some kind of of hundred percent certainty that this is my call. Um, I believe that it is because I believe that God has called me here. Uh, and so I just lean into that courage as hard as I can every day. Amen. Uh, Eric Immel, you know, technological mistakes were made last week, but I'm so grateful <laughs> that you had the courage to try again and join us for Jesuit Lunch Hour.